two shaky handheld videos in one week. Aren't you lucky? So, uh, if you saw the last video, you know that I tested out whether the um, Marlin Fork that did the uh, 256K hack on the SKR Mini E3 version 1.2, I think I got all that right, was actually legit or not in terms of writing firmware bigger than the memory that it's supposed to have on the chip. Well, there were some questions as to what was going on and what problems might arise. So what I did with that video was I built up a binary that was bigger than 256K, uploaded it from the SD card using the bootloader that's already on the board, and uh, then ran a print, actually ran a bunch of prints over the last like day or two days or whatever it was, including... Um, printing over Octoprint. So whoever it was that asked me in the comments, that, that does work. I did get it to print over Octoprint. That doesn't mean that like serial or tether printed is necessarily all hammered out right now, but in answer to the question, it did work. And I was able to send and receive commands and all that happy horse crap. But anyways, so there was a question of whether it will be a full binary, whether that full binary would then be able to be uploaded from the SD card by the bootloader that's on the board, or if you'd have to, you know, use a um, ST link or something like that. And then whether the bootloader was truncating the binary when it loaded it into the program memory on the MCU, and whether the entire um, firmware was all intact or if there was some stuff missing. I decided to, let me get that back in frame here. I decided to go ahead and run all the tests and show you that everything appears to be cool, at least on my board. Now, I do know that they've gone through different revisions of like the bootloader and all that stuff, so I can't speak to everybody, and I also can't speak to everybody's board, whether or not they have a, a chip that actually has the extended memory on it or not, but it's pretty easy to check, see if it works or not. Anyways, so I'll show you what I did, and then you can draw your own conclusions. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to try to be as thorough as possible with the tools that I have here and the time I have available, but if anyone thinks of any other clever way I can try testing this, let me know. So the tools I'm going to be using are OpenOCD, which is a uh, on-chip debugger, uh, STinfo, STFlash, and then just the ST Microelectronics toolkit. So it was already known that some of these chips had more flash than they said they had. That was known all the way back to the stm 30 do Duino days. And in addition to the STM32 Duino guys, it was also found by the uh, Espruino guys and the Embed folks and various other people. And they all handled it a little bit differently. The STM32 Duino people made a different, you know, script and definition for the blue pill boards that had the 128K as opposed to the 64K. I saw some Espruino stuff where they used the definition for the uh, RD T6 instead of the RC T6, which has uh, 384K. But that's all talky talky. Let's do testy testy because numbers don't lie. And I'll do more um, information that I found and people I talked to and speculation at the end of this video, way at the end. So you can check that if you want. And feel free to add any info that you may have in the comments, as long as it's, you know, verified and solid, backed up by numbers and that type of thing. Oh, and another thing, just to make this more convoluted, it would always be possible that a manufacturer can get a batch of like counterfeits and not know it, which may actually only have 256K on there, or the upper memory could be bad or something like that, and that's why it was disabled. So just bear that in mind as well. So I didn't just want to make a file with random numbers. I wanted to make it legit. So I uh, retweaked the firmware. I put a custom name on machine so that would pop up on the screen. I'd immediately know if it flashed from the bootloader or not. Then I added a couple more features to make sure it was significantly more than 256K and just dumped that on a card and flashed it with the regular bootloader. So that worked fine. That part is confirmed, but we already confirmed that the other day. And I'll cut out the verifying stuff on these other boards and I'll just focus on the SKR because that's all we really care about. Oh, and these two different boards that I'm testing, one of the chips was made in the Philippines and the other was made in Malaysia. So they have two different, two completely different factories that they came out of and they're, they're both showing this behavior. So I pulled the SKR back out of my printer. I hope people appreciate what I do for you because I just got this put in. So I could hook it up to an ST-Link and see what was going on. Now the SKR Mini is pretty easy to hook up to the ST-Link because the headers are labeled. Unfortunately, they're not on the Mini E3, but this is open source, remember? So we can pull up these files and just see where the pin headers go and take a peek see. So ST Info Probe just shows that, well, it looks like it only has 262,144 bits on it. So 
that's obviously not 512k, but it's already known if you dig into like some of the open OCD um, header files, they have ways of getting around that because it is fairly common enough that these chips are flashed with a flash size identifier that does not correspond to the on fl chip flash that they made ways around that. But open C OCD also reports 256k. However, by changing some of the configuration files, you can make it so that uh, it shows up as 512K and then it'll just go ahead and flash as best it can, which it did indeed flash over 256K. Okay, fine, that's open OCD though. Let's look at something more tangible. Now, these chips come in a couple different configurations, 256K, 384K, and 512K. That's just the program memory but we have 64K of RAM as well. Now that's interesting because 256K of program memory plus 64K of RAM is not a configuration that should technically exist. Even if you open up uh, SE's programming tools and file through there and look for the, look the chips and sort by size, you're not gonna find it. So just to make sure I wasn't crazy, I checked Octopart, I checked Mauser, I checked DigiKey, and I found exactly zero chips with that configuration on the market. And none of the data sheets I found had that configuration either. The only place I saw it mentioned was one picture of like marketing stuff from ST's website, and that didn't have exact specifications, it was just broad categories. So that's all to say that it's likely that this is a 512K part, and they have the full amount of RAM on it. Now, that doesn't prove anything, so what we're gonna have to do is flash a big old file, read it back, compare it to the binary, and see if it's the same thing. So ultimately, I think it ended up being, when all is said and done, like 670K-ish or something like that, because you have the firmware plus the memory space for the bootloader and then the little chunk for the EEPROM. So hook the SKR back up again, plug it into my ancient laptop that's running Windows 10, get through all the blue screens and the nonsense, and see what we can see. But first, let me do a demonstration with a known board, that is the blue pill. So I took the binary, dragged it onto the same SD card, and as you can see, it's 266K, that's rounded down, so it's like 266K, 6K and a half, plus some other stuff when we're all said and done. Drop that onto the SD, drag that over to my other machine, and then I was said, well, we know that this blue pill has 128K, even though it says it has 64K, so let's see what happens when we try to put a 266K file on there, just so we can see what the response is. And the response is immediately, nope, it just won't even try to do it. So enter the SKR board. I went ahead and plugged this in, connected, and this is a, a dump of the all the memory nonsense. And as you can see, this is just starting from zero on the user memory space, and our binary is over 256K. Cool. We can go up here to our target, and then we can compare what's in the memory to the binary file itself, which I dragged over from the other computer. So you click that, it'll go ahead and grind through the whole thing. You tell it what memory address to start at. I'm going to start at, I added a 7 there, as you see, because we have to have room for our bootloader. And grind, 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 progress, progress, green bar game, boom, no difference down. File is already downloaded. Even though it says that we only have 256K of space, we've definitely written a 266K file. So the bootloader did not truncate it in any way. But because that file that was sitting on the MCU's memory was uploaded from the SD card via the uh, SKR bootloader. I can do you one better than that. Let's go ahead and wipe the whole thing. And then instead of starting at memory location zero, I'll start at memory location question mark right here, like halfway through the space. So I don't know, 128K in or something like that. Then I'm going to go ahead and flash the firmware, which we know is should be 266 plus, starting at that memory address. So that should feed well over 256K and bleed into that 512K space if it does exist. And as you can see, it did that just fine. So we can go ahead and compare that to the firmware, read it back off of the memory, see if the two match. And as you can see, there's a perfect match between the two of them. But I would hate to leave you with two of these SKR videos in a row without any math lessons, so here we go. We know from looking at the ST tool that this is our end address, end memory address, and this is our start memory address. So the um, 0x08007000 is right after the bootloader, and that's where the user space begins where we're uploading the Marlin firmware. 
those are hexadecimal addresses. So we can convert those into something that makes more sense to human beings. We can take that and convert it to one, three, four, five, one, two, blah, 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 blah. That's the decimal equivalent, which means it's one, three, one, three, six, zero, blah, 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 KIB, or one, three, four, five, one, two, kilobytes. Likewise, we can do that with the end address and we come up with 134246.4 KB. Now, what happens when you take the end address and you subtract the beginning address? Well, then you get the size, which is 266.4 KB. That sounds familiar because it happens to be the size of our binary file. Yay, it worked. So question answered, right? Well, not exactly, because nobody really knows except for some people at ST why ST does this with some of their chips. We've known that it existed with the blue pill and some of the ugly blue shields as well, but nobody really knows exactly why. And we can speculate it, it uh, with manufacturing of semiconductors. It's all going to come down to like pricing. So... It seems to be the answer is for chips of a particular family and a particular pin count, they use the same die. And if any of this sounds phony baloney and somebody has better, more verified information, just let me know, please. And that memory should be there and it should be okay, but they don't qualify it. So it would be commercially irresponsible to sell something that was based on a processor that was only qualified for, say, 256K, even if it has 512K. But for the home user, there's no reason not to use that. So I'll keep an eye out for anybody that runs into any problems. But until then, I'm, I'm going to run it if that means anything to you. Even if I have to make my own branch. And I may even go in and hack it so that um, you can use the complete amount of SRAM that's available too. Because right now we're limited to less than the amount that's actually on every one of these chips that I've looked at. And I guess whether you call this like a mod or a hack or like a DIY thing versus like a commercial thing, that's up to you. I guess it was falling in the same category as like, you know, overclocking where, you know, the companies know what's going on. They let it happen, but you're probably going to like, you know, void your warranty or anything like that. And look, I know overclocking is different these days, but I literally overclocked my first laptop by soldering different oscillator chips on the board. So I'm a little old school with that stuff. But as far as troubleshooting, I would definitely say if you're going to hop on some forums and say, hey, I'm having problems with this firmware and my board. Definitely tell them if you're running the 512K version or not, just to see if that's a part of it, so we have more data sets, if nothing else. And I've actually traced down where ST was asked about it a couple times, and it was sort of, they give a roundabout-ish answer, and then some of those threads disappeared. But anyway, it seems that it boiled down to like economics and testing time and supply and demand and that type of stuff. And I did actually find somebody on Stack Exchange who said that Flash is there and it's not bad. It's just not ever tested and then sold at a lower price. So it should be perfectly usable. There's also the possibility that there were some bad sectors or whatever and that part got disabled. But with chips this cheap, we're not talking like you know, a giant CPU for like a gaming computer that you're going to pay like, you know, 500 to 1500 bucks for or something like that, or like a, you know, $10,000 Xeon server processor. So in comparison with chips this cheap that sell for a couple bucks, you can easily blow past all your profit margin just with testing time. And the answer to like, is that flash messed up was if their production was that sketchy, they would have to map all the sectors on each chip. Otherwise you would have bizarro memory gaps and you wouldn't see any additional flash other than what's on there. And I found just in a random search, somebody did say that on the chips, there's two bytes that show the factory programmed flash, but apparently that's not on all of the chips and it's not on a lot of the F103RCs. So that would mean that the amount of flash reported in a lot of your programs isn't even read off of bits that don't even correspond to the proper amount of flash. It's just the company saying this is supposed to have this amount of stuff. So that's what they type into, you know, the headers and the C files that go into the libraries that run these things. And it is confirmed that those bits don't actually correspond necessarily to the amount of flash that's on the chip. That's just how much they wanted to report it having. But who cares about what people say? Let's just test it and see what's going on. All right, I'm done talking. See you in the next video.